Good morning. Merry Christmas. It's great to see each one of you here today. Thank you for being a part of our worship experience here today. I want to share with you, if, you've, uh, if you're new here, or even if you've been here for a while, there's a card in the pew back in front of you that's called a Connect card. Can you take a moment to fill that out? Maybe, maybe you've got a new uh, email address or a new phone number or anything. Be, be sure and give us that. But if you've, uh, if you've never filled one out before, maybe fill one out. We'd like to know how to reach you and see what's going on. You can change, change your email, change your phone number. Can't change your birthday, but you could, you know, you could try that. But thanks. But we're, we're glad to have you here today and part of uh, this on Christmas Eve. I just want to share with you that we'll be back here tonight at 5 o'clock uh, for our time of, of silent night and the candle lighting and just the, the joyful time of Holy Communion. It'll be, be very special for our 5 o'clock service that we have. And so uh, next Sunday is December 31st. It's a fifth Sunday, and we will be combining with, uh, with the, uh, there'll be a combined worship service at 11 o'clock, and this time it will be down at the Family Life Center. That's really where it's going to be. So it'll be at 11, at 11 o'clock, just one service, and it'll be down at the Family Life Center, be led by Ignite. So we're excited about that. So if you come here next Sunday and you see, where'd everybody go? We're here. We're just down the other end. So please come on down for that. We're so thankful. Now, Larry has a very important announcement that I'm very excited about. Go ahead, Larry. Since last January, our wonderful organ has been silent. And now it has finally been repaired. And we are so excited to reintroduce the organ. <laughs>
Rose said? Stand for the reading of the gospel. Luke 1, 26 through 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her, who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. This is the word of God for the people of God. Be to God. Please remain standing and greet each other. <laughs>
I'll come thou day spring come and cheer our spirits by thine advent here disperse the gloomy cloud tonight and death's dark shadows born to fly reach your Christmas. Thank you all. Christmas. Love all, lovely, love divine. Love was born at Christmas. Star and angels gave the sign. Worship we the Godhead. Love incarnate, love divine. Worship we are Jesus, but we're with the sacred sign. Love shall be our token. Love be yours and love be mine. Love to God and others. Love for play and gift and sign. Christian Rossetti. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. John three sixteen.
To a time of prayer and join with me. Lord, wouldn't it be the best Christmas if in these moments we all around the world could truly enter into that heavenly peace that you call us to. With the power of your son Jesus Christ in our lives, we can. Dear God, I thank you for this house of worship. I thank you for allowing us the opportunity to be free, to receive this amazing gift, this gift of love that came down at Christmas time. Lord, as we receive this love, may we freely give this love to those here, those in our immediate circle of friends and family, but more importantly, around the world. May that love that came down at Christmas 
continue. Lord, I pray for those right now who are facing health challenges, financial challenges, relationship challenges, and those who are just feeling down, anxious, may you give them that heavenly peace that you promise us in song. And we pray now as you taught the disciples to pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and the word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our scripture this morning is from 2 Samuel 7, 16. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. This is the word of God for the people of God. I'd like to ask our young people, our children, to come on down and join me. Not here today, but we're going to go over here because it's Christmas. We're going to go to the Christmas tree, the Chrisma tree. Emerson, come on down. Yeah, Neil, Neil, you can come down too. So we yeah, called her out. So. <laughs> okay. Oh, and here comes Sophia. All right. Glad to see you all. Thank you all for being here today. What do we have? What do we call this? A Christmas tree. It's called a Christmas tree, and it's got a special name for it in our church. It's called a what, Molly? Chrismon tree. So what does the Chrismon stand for? Well, Chris. Chris is part of Christmas, and mon has to do with what's called monograms, monograms that we have. And they are, they are beautifully made ornaments, or chrismons they're called, that are covering our whole tree. And many of these were made way before you were born. Some of them made before your mommies and daddies were born. Some of these have been here for a long time, these special chrismons. And so one of the things that we're going to do is look at these chrismons and see some beautiful things. And just look how, I want to point out one particular one. Do you see a shell, Emerson? Do you see a shell? Yes, shell. There it is. Yeah, there's a shell. This is beautiful. And I was reading in this book we have in the library about our chrismon tree. It's our beautiful library that Miss Adrian leads our library. And it's down there. It has books on display. You can check out just like that and borrow. And so it, it talked about it here in this book about the shell. And the shell was a symbol that was used for baptism. And so this was a, a thing that you would use to pour water on people. And if you see, are there three little stones in there? Okay, what do they stand for? Do you know? I learned this today by reading the book. Yes, Molly? Trinity. My goodness, yes, we got that right. It's the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You're ready for confirmation class, I think. You're coming, you're coming along. So, so each one, so now th this, I want you to think about this, that a long time ago, 2,000 years ago, the, the early, yes, the early church, that was a long time ago, not everybody knew how to read. And I know most of y'all know how to read, and you're learning how to read, something like that, which is good, but a lot of people didn't know how to read back then. Even the grown-ups did not know how to read. So they used symbols like these, or chrismons, that taught them a message. So every one of these chrismons is made so specially and each one teaches us something very important, just like the shell and the, and the Trinity, like you said. Each thing is taught. And, but I, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad we have symbols of our faith that speak like this. I'm also glad we have people in this church who are good at craft work, at doing like arts and crafts and making things. And you know what? This is something that's been going on not just now, but in the past. 
and for many years people have put together these little beads. Imagine how hard it would be to make a chrismon like that with the different beads like that. It has, so it's symbolic, but it's also it's a beautiful work of art that they've done. And so when you see these, you realize each one means something special. And maybe you see one that means something special for you. Does anybody see one that they would have point, wanted to point out that you wanted to ask me about? I mean, I know the answer, but go ahead. Okay, Rose, go ahead. Yes. Um, Which one? Why are there so many angels? So many angels, right. In the Christmas tree. Why are there so many angels in the because Christmas tree? Yeah, on Jesus' birth. Yeah, Sophia said, like, when Jesus, because what happened then is, remember, they said on that night he was born that there was a heavenly host. That means there was a lot of angels. I don't know how many, but, yes, Charlotte, go ahead. Oh, what's that little wooden baby up there? What's the wooden baby up there? Oh, my goodness, look at that. I hadn't noticed that, yeah. Charlotte. You know what? I think I see that as a cherub angel is what I see. It's got a little violin to it. You see a violin on there? I like your glasses. Those will help you to see better, too, don't you? But Emerson, do you want to say something? What's this one right here? I may need to look that one up. This is okay. Now, now that is a what? Is that a, is that the Lamb of God? So this, I think that's a lamb. Is that a lamb or a donkey? It looks like a lamb to me. It's a lamb of God, and so it shows Jesus is known as one of the words he was known as, known as the Lamb of God, who's taken our. He, he's provided for us. In other words, his sacrifice is is the one that stays with us. Yes, go ahead. Which one you want to talk about? What's th this one right here? No, which one? this one right here. Oh, this is a beautiful one right here. This talks about the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit, we talk about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And the God the Holy Spirit is the Spirit's coming down like a dove. And so we see doves in here a lot. So the Spirit comes down like a dove and, and receives us. So, so the Holy Spirit is with us always. It's with us in this room right now, the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit was also there at Jesus' baptism. Yes, Molly? Okay, now this one, I'm going to need to look that one up. <laughs> that one's the burning bush. That's the burning bush? Well, Sophia, you might have that right. That looks like the burning bush. I think you might have that right. That looks like the burning bush. And it could also be, it could be the Pentecost, the flame at Pentecost. But it could be the burning bush. I'll go with the burning bush. Good answer to that. Y'all agree, burning bush? It's a burning bush. Yes, it's a burning bush. Well, you all are enjoying this. I invite you to come down after church and get some pictures with this. And this book, I'm going to return it to Miss Adrian right here. So she's got it right here for the library. But it has lots of good answers in there, so it's really good to know about that. But, but there's some really good chrismons here. And maybe you know some people in here who might have made the chrismons, some of them, and they can still make them. Yes, Molly? Does the tree skirt mean anything? Does the tree skirt mean anything? I'm sure it does. I don't know the answer to that, but I'm sure it does mean something. Yes, sir. Sure. The star on top of every tree? Is there a star up there? I have no idea. No. It's pretty high up there, isn't it? You know, that's, that's way high up there. But the star is to remind us the star that shined on Christmas morning to shine on Jesus. Yes. You can also put an angel on top of the tree. You can put an angel on top of the tree, too. That's a good thing. Well, I hope you all enjoy Christmas. Let's, let's, go, ahead and, let's go ahead and pray, okay? Let's pray to God. Dear, dear God, thank you for the symbols of Christmas. And thank you that we can celebrate. Thank you for this church, the people who've come before us, and those that are still making things and helping us celebrate this special day. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all go to Children's Church now. Take okay. Good.
I heard the bells at Christmas. That's beautiful, Bob. And we, we talked about that, that particular poem a couple of weeks ago. Christmas. Christmas bells are going to come after I preach, so you'll probably want to have me wrap up this sermon quick. So here are our bells. The bells now? Oh, bells now. Okay. Bells now. The bells of the offertory. So, I, I believe that's correct. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think it's after the sermon. Okay, we're, we're on track. Okay, good. Thank you, Larry. But, uh, but so, so uh, the, bell, the bells, you know, you hear the bells, you hear Bob's song, you hear the bells that we have here. Uh, I'm reminded of the song Silver Bells. That's a beautiful song. All these bell songs bring back special memories, don't they, of, 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 of ways we can celebrate Christmas. I remember Silver Bells singing that at Texas Tech my last year there with Daria, and it's a we were singing it because we were part of the, the, the Carol of Lights that we were doing. It just, you know, the, 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 the songs we have, the memories, the things that just lodge into you uh, makes a difference. The stories, the images that you have, they bring a smile or maybe a tear um, and it, maybe eventually an acceptance of the true meaning of Christmas that you had. You know, Christmas for me was growing up as the middle son of, uh, of three, three boys in a family with a stay-at-home mom, and I had a, uh, a, my dad, who, especially at the time that I was growing up, was going through a time of, uh, of, of recessions, recessions that we had in our economy, in our country, and we were kind of navigating those waters with just a one-income family, and it was, it was hard uh, to get through. And I, I remember this one particular Christmas that we'd had a pretty rough year, just getting, getting by, but, uh, but we were still there, we were having Christmas time together, and I remember it specifically, my dad had, had gotten back to work, and so we had some income, and so we were grateful for that, and we had, uh, we had Christmas plans, everybody's going to come over to our place, we're, we're having our, our Christmas the next morning, but Christmas Eve, I recall that I was so eager to go to church, I wanted to go to church on Christmas Eve, I'd been through confirmation class, and I thought, I really want to go to church on Christmas Eve, you know what my dad said? So we're not going to go tonight. And I thought, oh man, what a sour way to look at things. We're not going to go tonight. And he said, oh, I'm tired. I've got a lot to do. And you know, we just can't, we just, we just aren't going to, not going to go to Christmas Eve service tonight. So I was kind of, I was kind of bummed. And we all stayed home that night. We sort of went to bed early. And, you know, I was uh, just, you know, just kind of wondering. And the next morning we got up and we had, we had a, our Christmas presents. And, you know, there was, there were some and it was, it was nice. It was a good thing. But as we were about to wrap up, my dad says, there's one more I see under the tree back in the back. It was this long, skinny one that was there. And so we uh, said, let's open that up. We opened it up, and it was a, a pool cue that needed to be assembled, put together. And we said, pool cue? And my dad was kind of quirky and kind of, you know, funny at times, things he was doing. But I'm going, what is this pool cue back here? And he said, boys, there's another one just like it in the garage. So we go out to the garage, and there was another pool cue lined up against a pool table, homemade, that he'd stayed up all night to make. He had built a homemade pool table out of plywood and just materials he had around the garage. And he created this pool table for us to have on Christmas morning. We were so excited. 
It was an amazing thing that he had done just to create something for us to have. And it was perfect timing because he had three boys who were about teenagers or about to be teenagers who were, who were there needing something that would bring us together and bring us, really give us a good place to come at home, to be home to. So the pool table, so it didn't have a green felt table, it had a purple felt to it, because all we had was some purple felt around, so we just used the purple felt to make that. We didn't actually have pool balls, we had golf balls that we used, just to play with golf balls. I mean, we were playing with that. We had our two pool cues, and eventually we, we saved up, and he bought some billiard balls that we had for that. But this was like the best gift. Because it came from himself. It was something he had actually done. He, he had put it together. He'd stayed up. The reason we couldn't go to Christmas Eve service was he was in the garage, busy making all this. He had a lot of stuff in the car, too, that he needed to pull in to some supplies to make this pool table. And it was uh, something that for years we'd play pool in the garage on this homemade purple pool table. It made a difference in our relationship with each other. Our friends came over to play with us there, too. They became a, the kind of a go-to place, come to the McNabb's house and play on their homemade purple pool table because it was a joyful thing to be able to do. I think it was a masterful thing of, of my dad really realizing what we really needed. The impossible became possible. How do I guide three teenage boys into adulthood to be the men of God? Why don't I bring them together with this gift? I'm not sure what your Christmas memories are or one of your favorite Christmases, but I'm sure you have some that that come into your mind that you think about about Christmas time and things that, that may come, uh, that, that, that come up, bubble up the top of your mind. And I wonder about that first Christmas, the Christmas memories that Mary would have treasured in her heart. And I, I hear this, this story that we share each Christmas and we, we, we want to know afresh, how did Mary perceive this? Because that very first Christmas, it was just Mary and Joseph that were the only ones celebrating Christmas at that moment. They were the ones that knew it, that saw that first Christmas. Of course, the angels came, the shepherds and the wise men, but that Mary and Joseph were there. I wonder what Christmas memories Mary would share. Well, we can look to the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke, and we can sort of see, because she was the first-hand witness that shared with the writers, with Matthew and with Luke, of what that first Christmas was like and how she experienced it. You know, the TV show, The Chosen, you, you may have seen that. I, I'm really enjoying that. I think they've had season three, they finished. I think season four is starting. It's got some amazing, you might say the backstory, the backstory of, of the gospel, of sharing with us some, some good things about some, some background information that would help and tell us, like, fill in the gaps that we have. One of the things that I realized in watching The Chosen is that Mary, you know, this story, the Gospels were written like 40 to 50 years after the actual events took place, in some cases. So Mary would have been telling Matthew and Luke about the birth narrative from a 40 or 50 year perspective, looking back on that. And I believe, just as I can tell you right now about the purple pool table that was more than 40 years ago, with vivid detail, she too could share about that birth narrative in vivid detail. She could share with you what it meant. And I believe part of that is she could share the emotions that she felt. Because she knew those emotions that, that drove uh, how she was feeling as a teenage mom there with this baby. And I imagine two of the biggest emotions that she would have experienced are two biggest emotions that we experience a lot. And one is love, and the other is fear. Let's take fear first. Can you imagine the fear that would have been instilled in her when she realized that she was going to be pregnant as a teenage, unwed teenage mom. The fear of what this is going to be like. I've known some people who are teenage moms. I know the fear that they've had of being pregnant as a teenager. What this, is, what this brings. And that day especially, it brought a great deal of reproach or rejection, criticism, by society, how could you be pregnant? And you know, it's interesting that fear that came with that also drove her to seek love. And the love that she would receive would be from a relative of hers named Elizabeth. Elizabeth was on the other end of the spectrum. She was older, and she, though, had never had any children. And by an ironic twist, she also was one who received criticism. How could she not ever have children? 
The reproach of society is cruel. And the reproach for her was, you must be being punished for something that you've become barren all these years. Horrible thing that they would say that. But th this, this back talk of why would you and your husband not have, Zechariah, not have any kids? So you have these two women. One who's being criticized for having a baby and one who's criticized because she doesn't have any children. It's ironic, though, when they came together, when they came together that the baby in Elizabeth's womb would jump at the sound of the Lord in the womb of Mary. And they embraced, and they found great love, Elizabeth and Mary, to love one another and to accept one another, no matter if society was being critical of both of them for whatever reason, that they would be, they would find that acceptance in each other. Let's talk more about the fear, because the fear was there. Fear of how am I going to explain this to, to Joseph? Fear of how am I going to, to live into this, this life? Who is this baby that's coming into to, to my life? The fear that was, was there. Many questions that she certainly would have had but we have this, this, angel, this angel Gabriel, this angel Gabriel that comes to her. And the angel, the angel says, fear not. Well, it's easy for you to say. You're not expecting a baby, you know, but fear not. The Lord is with you. And the angel explains to, to Mary, when Mary asks, how can this be? She asks. And he says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. Holy Spirit. And Mary takes that and receives that and takes a step of faith to walk with that. Now I contrast that with another visit by the angel Gabriel to six months earlier to Zechariah. Now Zechariah was a priest. He was a man who, who was considered important in the society. And he had the important task, the big task, wearing the robes and going before God into the Holy of Holies. And they, they send him in there before the Holy of Holies because he's got the big time job. And he goes in there, and he meets the angel Gabriel. And in that conversation, he asks the same question. When, when Gabriel says, well, your wife Elizabeth is going to conceive, and he says, no way. This isn't going to happen. We're old. This cannot happen. And the more he denies God's possibilities, the more the angel gets a little, little angry. And he says, fine. You're not going to be able to talk for the next nine months took away his ability to talk. It made him sign. In other words, this man who had, you might see a lot going for him, being a priest and being one with an important position, showed no faith that God could do these things. And, and then Mary said, showed faith. And the thing she said in her response to the angel is something I believe you and I need to say. She said, I am a servant of the Lord. I'm the Lord's servant. What if we could all say that? How would that change the world? If we could all say, I am the Lord's servant. Let's try it. Let's all say it together. I am the Lord's servant. Let's say it again. I am the Lord's servant. One more time. I am the Lord's servant. Doesn't that change things? When you realize that you are here to do the Lord's work. The Lord is calling you to do that servant work. It's no longer about me. It's not the world rotating around me. It's, it's, it's me serving and being willing to give. It changes everything. When Mary said, I am the Lord's servant, and she went forward to do the work that God had given her to bring in to the world God's Son. It changed everything with that willingness to be the Lord's servant. You know, the scripture that Kate read out of Samuel was talking about King David. And King David remembered, remembered in that chapter that he was nothing, really, before God put him into this position to be the king. He, he was a shepherd boy in the pasture, and God took him out of being the shepherd boy in the pasture to put him into doing some important work. And he realized that, yes, he may be king, but he realized that, really, he was just a shepherd boy who said, I'm available. 
He said, I am the Lord's servant. And God promised him at that moment that he would, that his, his line would continue and that eventually there would be a new king, a king that would rule forever, that would come from the line of David. And that king was a very different kind of king. That king would be Jesus, who would come lowly and in a manger and come into this world, be persecuted by the world, but be serving the world and serving people and there to save people, even people who despised him. He was there for them. He was saying, I am the Lord's servant. He was putting himself to work. So King David, all the way through to Jesus, we see this great line that continues. We see Christ, Christ coming as the King of kings and the Lord of lords and the one who would deliver us by taking the role of a servant. So I probably wouldn't be standing here today if it wasn't for another David. And he was uh, Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave was uh, an important part of my faith development. I'm talking about like later on in life. I was like in my late 40s. And I was in church, and Pastor Dave really shaped me and helped encourage me, especially going on mission trips and engaging and serving God. We talk about Christmas memories. Pastor Dave shared one that I want to share with you today. He was doing a Christmas Eve service one night, and he was in a, a mid-sized church in Darwin. He was busy, 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 going around, taking care of all the details. At home, he and his wife had four teenage kids or pre-teenage kids, but they, they, were, they were busy raising kids. It was sometimes hard to make it financially on how they were going, but they were, they were there. And Pastor Dave shared with us that there was a Christmas Eve service where he was taking care of all the details, running around, and right as he's getting ready to come into the sanctuary, he gets tapped on the shoulder, and somebody said, excuse me, Pastor, but... My, my girlfriend and I are trying to get to Louisiana. We need some gas money. Can, can you help us? And he said, I'm really busy right now. We're about to start service. I can't really do this right now. The church office is closed. We're just doing this service. And something tells Dave on the back of his head, just have the guy sit down. He says, why don't you just sit down here in the back, and I'll, uh, I'll talk to you after church. So this guy, who he found out his name was Joe, sits down in the back. And they have a lovely worship service that Pastor Dave leads, and he, uh, the choir, the music, the silent night, the candles, the communion, everything like that. And at the end, Pastor Dave's locking the church up. He's taking care of things, and then, oh, there's that guy, Joe, in the back. Only this time, Joe's preg pregnant girlfriend has actually come in, and she's been sitting in there in the back, and she attended the service, too. And he could tell that she was very pregnant. Very pregnant. And so Pastor Days takes them to his office and says, well, you know, our, our church office is closed and I can't get a check for you. If I could get a check, can't, can't cash it on Christmas Eve, that sort of thing. And then David asked, what's your name again? And she said, Mary. And your name's Joe? Joseph and Mary coming to my church on Christmas Eve, needing assistance. He realized that in his vest pocket, the church that night had collected an, a, a love offering for he and his wife. It was in an envelope with better than $300 in cash. Pastor Dave took that envelope out and gave it to Joseph and Mary. Because who else are you going to help on Christmas Eve but Joseph and Mary? They go out to the car, and he sees that he's going to see them off. He prays for them at the car, and all of a sudden, some guy in the back seat pokes his head out and goes, who's that? He goes, his name's Ned. He's going to Louisiana with us. Ned, how do we get a Ned in the Christmas story? Well, there is a Ned there. But he said, hey, guys. And so they all prayed together as they're going to Louisiana. Folks, Pastor Dave saw it. Mary saw it. They saw the role of being the Lord's servant, of embracing it and joining in with doing this. May you and I hear those words. I am the Lord's servant. May we embrace it. May we live it. May we love it.
remain standing for our hymn of commitment, joy to the world. If you have a decision that you need to make as a result of today's service, this would be the point at which we would invite you to come and speak with Pastor Pete. Or if you just want to come down for prayer, this would be that time. Thank you so much for being here today. Stick around, get some pictures by our Chrismon tree. See if you can figure out some of those Chrismons. There's some wonderful things to see there. And just enjoy this day, this special day. Back five o'clock tonight, for those that can make it, we'd love to have you at five. And then of course next Sunday at 11 in the Family Life Center with Ignite Led Worship Service. Hear these words of benediction. I am the Lord's servant. Let's say that together. I am the Lord's servant. Live it, love it, Embrace it and do it. <laughs>